Hi, this is Brother Richard, <clears throat> and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Protocol Christ Mystery. This will be lesson part 336. We're talking about the mechanics of salvation in response to a question <clears throat> that our dear <clears throat> sister Georgia proposed about <clears throat> the functions of the Holy Spirit. the earnest of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, and the fullness of the Spirit. Well, I find the easiest way to approach this is to give us the comprehension of salvation. Because these are phases that deal with salvation, the salvation process. So we want to begin with comprehending what salvation is from a biblical perspective. And before we even get to that part, I want to make a statement. One reason why salvation and the functions of the Holy Spirit are difficult to understand is because Man is not presented with his true state. <clears throat> Man identifies himself as a physical being in a physical world. The scripture identifies man as a spiritual being in a physical world. Man does not identify with his true makeup. He only identifies with a, par a partial percentage of his makeup which deals with his physical aspect. But man's reality exists beyond the physical. Man is a triune being. Body, soul, and spirit. Unfortunately, man lives in a society that puts no value on any other aspect of his function than his physical. Therefore, Man is not educated to comprehend how he really functions. He only is <clears throat> moved to focus on one aspect of his true function. Having said that, the salvation experience does not take place in the physical aspect of man's functioning. It takes place in the spiritual aspect of man's functioning. Scripture teaches the reality of salvation comes into the life of a person who believes and confesses that the Lord Jesus died and rose again to pay for their sins. In other words, the Scripture is telling us that man's spiritual functioning is <clears throat> literally under a death sentence because of a transgression that was passed down to him. Turn to Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 9 to 10. <clears throat> Salvation addresses the spiritual dysfunction of man does not center on the physical function of man at all. Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. <clears throat> For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It all progresses in the spiritual realm. It has nothing to do with the physical aspect of man at all. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches, at this point, 
God, in the person of the Holy Spirit, performs a supernatural act of creation in the person's spiritual makeup. He is birthed into the family of God. Turn to the Gospel of John, the first chapter, verse 11 to 13. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. <clears throat> but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So the scripture is telling us, in no uncertain terms, that salvation is <clears throat> a process that takes place totally in the spiritual makeup of man. Now what actually happens? It deals with man's soul. Man is a triune creation. Physical body, spiritual soul, spiritual spirit. The soul is the seed of personality. It is the true man. Within the soul are the characteristics that make him an individual. Within the soul uh, is the seat of memory, the ability to comprehend consciousness, the ability to perform and function as a sentient being. Well, what happens in this question? Well, pertain to what we've just read. Okay. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Mm -hmm. Did they have the born again experience? Yes. Okay. Yes. By receiving him. Yes. And confessing, they believe God raised him from the dead. Exactly. Okay. When that takes place, we're looking at the mechanism. Something happens in the inside of the individual to change him from what he was before to what he is becoming. That has to do with a supernatural move of God, an act of creation. What is that act of creation? God, the person of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> comes in and cohabits, joins, makes a union with the soul of the individual. That is the supernatural act of creation. That is what makes the individual a son of God. The union of the Spirit of God with the soul of the individual. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to bring Seth into this. Seth. When Seth became, men began to call upon the Lord. Yes. Okay. So, when they called upon the Lord, they didn't have the born-again experience, did they? No. 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 That, that was something radically different. Seth had what was called the image of God. In other words, Seth was an Adamic of the Adamic race. The line of the Adamic race to incarnate into the human race. But that was something totally different. <clears throat> they uh, <coughs> still needed to ultimately to uh, experience something that would save them. We want to continue okay, I'm here. Sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm giving us a continuous okay. view of salvation, so that <clears throat> we get a comprehension of where the Holy Spirit fits in on this. Yes, what happens <clears throat> in this unique? Creation. We said God, the person of the Holy Spirit, unifies, makes a union with the soul of the individual. 
making him a new creation. Turn to the Gospel of John, the third chapter, <clears throat> verses 5 to 6. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So, Jesus is emphasizing the new birth as something that has nothing to do with the physical. He's emphasizing a a mechanism takes place in the spiritual makeup of man. He's trying to get Nicodemus to understand this because Nicodemus is focusing on the physical. Well, does a man have to be born from his mother's womb again? <clears throat> With that understanding, he goes on to say, <clears throat> water and of the spirit. What, is this, what does this mean? Why you have water and you have the Spirit being brought into the new birth experience. When Jesus died, two things came out of him. Blood and water. We know that the blood cleanses. The blood enables what was corrupted what was <clears throat> um, rejected to be put in a state of purity, cleansing. When the blood is applied to a life, that life becomes pure and holy. What is the purpose of the water? The water is the act of what is called regeneration. The water is what enables the life to be changed from what it was to become a new being. So you have to have two things. You have to have the cleansing of the blood and the regeneration of the water. Turn to the book of Titus, third chapter. Titus, the third chapter, verse Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said you have to be born of water and of the Spirit to be saved. <clears throat> In this respect, <coughs> everybody that's born again experiences the same thing. They experience the cleansing, and then they experience the regeneration, which makes them a new create a new sentient being. Then, yes. So then they become they were born again. Yes. And incorporated in the born again experience is the washing of regeneration and the changing. Yes, the cleansing of the blood, 
the washing is done by the Holy Spirit. The regeneration is the process of the Holy Spirit coming in, making us a new creation. He will not enter into a, a vehicle that is contaminated, yeah. corrupted. It has to be cleansed, and then he will enter in. In that respect, the soul of the born-again individual is radically different from the soul of the individual that is not born again from God's perspective. So different, turn to Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans, the 8th chapter, Paul here speaks about the soul, the spirit, verses 8 and 9. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. <clears throat> but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. God does not recognize an individual it will not favor an individual that does not have the spirit within him. <clears throat> you can go to a church for 50 years, you can read all you want about what takes place in the Bible, you can live a moral, upright life, and God will never recognize you as his son unless you have his spirit. Yes. Can a non-born-again pastor take somebody else through the born-again experience and it be legitimate? Yeah. Sure. Because the pastor's not the one who's going through that experience at that time. He's just giving the instructions of what the sure. person needs to do to be born again. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. But since the Lord cannot see the pastor who's doing it. I can see why the question, the question arises. By virtue of the fact, though, he's the, the, the Lord's not looking at the pastor, the Lord's sure. looking at the person. Sure. And the person takes what the pastor said, then the Holy Spirit will exactly do what he said he would do, and he becomes a new son, <clears throat> uh, a new creation on the inside. It's curious that you would find a pastor who's not born again. I know they, they exist, but I'm just, it's curious. A good percentage of them That's are true. not born again. What I'm thinking is they have contaminated their version of born again experience because of the lifestyle, so they quench the spirit. So they're, they're not operating with the spirit in them anymore. Right. That's what I'm saying, but, but I don't know if that's a reality. But you're talking about those who, have, who are born again and have diminished or quenched the spirit. And I'm point, I'm, I was talking about those who have never been born again, but yet still call themselves pastors. I just find that a very curious. You can go to university, mm -hmm. you can graduate, you can teach a mega church and yes. not be born again. Mm -hmm. I believe the majority of them that do that aren't born again. Because they don't exhibit the characteristics of an individual that has a spirit. Mm they met, mitigate against the Spirit. Right. They don't recognize the activities of the Holy Spirit. They're not moved by the Holy Spirit. They move by the intellect. They teach from a position of um, organized religion, not uh, 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 a congregation of Spirit-led saints. Every or, Organized religion does not acquiesce to any degree the things of the born again experience. Sure. But let's go on. <clears throat> so we see the first aspect of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> entering into the life of the individual, cohabiting with the soul of the individual in a union constitutes 
what is called the earnest of the Spirit. Turn Ephesians, the first chapter. He's in the first chapter, starting in verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Talking about the individual getting saved. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that, you believed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you hear, you believe, and you confess you are saved. What does it mean you're saved? It means that the Holy Spirit is now cohabit cohabiting with your soul in a union that did not exist before. You are now a son of God. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. What does this mean? This means the earnest of the Spirit is what's called the down payment of the Spirit. which comes from a, Hebrew, a Greek term, Araban, which means the measure of the Spirit, the payment of the Spirit, does two things. It is the seal that you are now a son of God, the property of God, Turn to Romans, the eighth chapter. Being the Son of God and the property of God, you are now an inheritor of the things of God. Let me ask the question so I can say I asked the question, Mr. Jones. Mm -hmm. Everybody that gets the earnest, is it equal measure to everybody? Yes. Okay. Yes. Romans 8 what? Romans 8th chapter, starting verse 15. For if not, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The earnest of the spirit is the spirit of adoption. In other words, the spirit that will lead us to the final conclusion, being fully adopted as sons. <clears throat> the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. He's, he's within us. He's in a union with our soul. So he's directing us. He's guiding us through our spirit. Not through the mind, through the spirit that's within each one of us. <clears throat> The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and of children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be glorified together. So it's a two-fold inheritance. An inheritance in the Father, a conditional inheritance in the Son. If we walk the path of a disciple, if we experience the sufferings of Christ, we will have a joint inheritance with Christ. Christ at the time of the restoration of all things. Amen. 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 Yeah, okay. My favorite word. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I thought it was praise the Lord. That's my favorite as well. <laughs> I have several. Now, Scripture teaches the earnest of the Spirit is what gives us eternal life. 
Turn to John, the 10th chapter, verse 27 to 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Eternal life enters into the individual at the time of the new birth. It's first start. Matter of fact, when you find out where it first started, turn to Gospel of John, 20th chapter. This, this is an experience, the recounting of Jesus' resurrection, his first appearing to his disciples in the upper room. Starting in verse 19. <coughs> down to verse 22. Then the same day at evening... Being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, <clears throat> when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. When he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. And were <clears throat> then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. <clears throat> When he had said this, thus, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Re <clears throat> Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is the first initial state of the born-again experience, where the Spirit inhabits the soul of the individual. After this initial state, the Holy Spirit <clears throat> will be imparted through what we call <clears throat> the individual uh, believing the death, the birth, I mean the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, confessing it, and then the Holy Spirit would automatically come in and indwell that individual's soul. That he'd be saved. This is essence and the quintessence of what we call salvation. This is the essence and the quintessence of what we call eternal life. Okay, so Mr. Jones, I'm going to ask a few things about what you just now said. Because Jesus led them and then took them through the experience himself, that they became the first born-again Christians. Mm -hmm. Okay? So now that pattern example is followed in faith by us when we recite, we believe Jesus was raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. we, we confess him as Lord and Savior. Yes. Yes. Anything else? No, this is what Paul talks about in Ephesians. You believed, you heard, you trusted, you became born again. Okay, but you confessed is what I was expecting you to say as well. Well, part of the born again experience is believing and confessing. Okay, well that's right. It goes. They didn't have to confess because of what Jesus did. We do because this is the mandate for expressing our faith. Sure. And in that respect, it's an unbroken procedure. What happened after this? In certain cases, the Sanhedrin heard and believed but didn't confess. Mm -hmm. So they were not <coughs> born again. Okay. Yeah. So the confession 
is a very important detail that cannot be left out. It seals it. So let me come back to what we've just said. The Sanhedrin heard and believed. They mm -hmm. knew that he was the Son of God. Yes. But they didn't confess it. That's right. And the reason they didn't confess it is because... Well, they, they wouldn't they wouldn't be uh, any longer in the group yeah, there it is. of there the uh, of the uh, elitists they would be outcasts the word had gone down from the high priest anybody that confesses him as being messiah you're out of here you can't participate in the society any longer you can't be part of the sanhedrin you're on the outs mm -hmm. so no they didn't they wanted to be uh, like the script the script even says that they 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 valued the praise of men more than the salvation that God offered. Turn to the Gospel of John, 1st John. 1st John, 5th chapter, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that begot, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know <clears throat> that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. It's talking about <clears throat> when you receive, believe, and you confess, you are begotten as a son. Because you have the spirit within you that testifies of your sonship and <clears throat> in this respect it means so, so many things it means number one you're God's property the devil cannot manipulate cannot control unless you allow it you have authority as a son and there's so many other things <clears throat> it sets you up for the second phase of what I call the salvation experience you have the earnest of the spirit the down payment of the Spirit, you have eternal life, but you do not have the power of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Scripture teaches the <laughs> baptism of the Holy Spirit gives the person the ability to live the eternal life that he's received <coughs> as the earnest. Turn to Ephesians. Now turn to... Um, Acts, the first chapter. Acts, the first chapter. Starting verse 4, down to verse 5. <coughs> <coughs> and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not, not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost is what gives the saint power to live the life of Christ. <clears throat> Without it, <clears throat> a person is living in his own strength, his own ability. With the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes the supernatural ability the gifts, the calling, the ability to have revelation, comprehension of the things of God. All this comes with the baptism. Does this explain why I think there were two of them, two brothers, I believe, <coughs> who tried to cast out a demon from somebody and couldn't? Yeah. Because they hadn't received the power. Yes. The baptism. Yeah. The um was uh, individuals that weren't even born again, mm. actually. 
because oh they weren't born again no oh okay but they saw paul baptizing right i mean paul casting out demons mm -hmm. and so they they go and they say well um this guy's demon possessed so they say <clears throat> i uh bind you i cast you out in the name of the spirit that paul cast you out okay and the demon says uh paul i know <clears throat> Christ I know, but who are you? And he jumped on him and... That's it. That's it. I missed the, yeah, I missed the part where they were right. born again. That's quite an important... <laughs> yes. Quite an important part. Yes. So what we find here... <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> turn to Luke 24. The scripture emphasizes the importance of receiving the baptism in several different places. Luke 24, verse 49. <clears throat> And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So there again, <clears throat> without the baptism, we have not the power to live the life that God has called us to live in Christ. Now, <clears throat> where does baptism come into all of this? Water baptism? Yes, water baptism. Turn to Romans, the sixth chapter. Verse four to five. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, <clears throat> that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. <clears throat> if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. What is he saying? Baptism is an open confession that you have accepted the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as <clears throat> payment for your sins, and now you are now walking in newness of life. All it is is an open confession of what has happened to you <clears throat> being born again. It has nothing to do with being saved. It is an act <clears throat> that God, through the Lord Jesus, commands us to do as an act of obedience. <clears throat> it's an act of confession. Jesus says, you confess me before men, I confess you before God. You're confessing exactly what has happened to you. I was alive, I died with God. Christ by going under the water you're showing symbolically you died then coming up out of the water you're showing symbolically that you've risen to a new life you are a new individual no longer the individual you were before that person is still dead <clears throat> that's all it is can it be considered a receipt proof that one is indeed born again it would be considered the first act of obedience mm -hmm. of one that is experienced born again. Can I ask a question? Sure. 
we've been cutting in and out again, so I'm uh, not exactly sure. Uh, Can I back up a little bit? You said the earnest sure. was when you're saved, correct? Yes. All right, and then you were talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Is that when you're is that when you are baptized in water? No. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a spiritual experience where the believer gets the power to live the life of Christ. Jesus set the example. He didn't go into his ministry until he was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And then the power Correct. came on him through the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. So we are to do the same thing. We are to experience the baptism, the Holy Spirit coming upon us to give us power to live the life that Jesus has called us to live. So where does the fullness come in? We're going to go into that in a minute. We haven't covered that yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we were talking about the first two phases of the born-again experience. The first phase is the earnest of the Spirit. That's where you get eternal life. That's where you're sealed as a son of God. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in and cohabits with your soul and communicates through your spirit. Then as you go on, you experience the power of the Holy Spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's where your talent, your calling comes in. The Holy Spirit will direct you into what God has called you to do, God's called you to be. Prophet, apostle, evangelist, healer, uh, whatever it is comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit coming into your life. Now, does that include the gifts of the Spirit? Does that include what? Yes. The gifts of that's the where Spirit? You get, that's where you get the gifts of the Spirit through the baptism. Now we're going to go into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> Scripture teaches the fullness of the Holy Spirit comes at the time of the rapture. At the time, turn to Romans the 8th chapter. We want verses 10 to 11. Romans 8, 10 to 11. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, in other words, if you have the earnest of the spirit dwelling in you, if you've been born again, and you endure to the rapture, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. The spirit that dwells in us, which starts off as the earnest, the measure, the down payment, will expand to his fullest. When that happens, we enter into, we become glorified creations. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter.
First Corinthians, the 15th chapter, <clears throat> gives us an understanding of what happens at the glorification. Uh, verse 42. And we're going to read down quite a bit. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Here he's talking about the natural birth. And then he's talking about what happens when <clears throat> you experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit at the rapture. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Albeit that which was first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Afterward, that which is spiritual. So we're born physically first. The new birth is spiritual. It starts with the soul. It completes with the physical body, where everything becomes spiritual, taken totally from the physical into the totality of the spiritual. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. The fullness of the Spirit, when the Spirit quickens the individual, he is fully able to operate in the heavens. He's no longer restricted to the earth. His physical body is totally going to be changed to a glorified state. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we also shall bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. I want to stop here and make a statement. When you are born again, your soul is cleansed, washed by the blood, regenerated, by the Spirit, and it becomes a new creation by the cohabitation of the Spirit with the soul of the saint. If that saint dies immediately, he can ascend into the heavens, because he has been created to become an inhabitant of the heavens. His body cannot go to heaven because it has not experienced the completion of the glorification process. So the body goes into the earth. The soul goes into the heavens where it has got a spiritual body waiting for it. At the rapture. Just before you go any further. Yes. Since you said, if the person dies immediately. Yes. Which we took on to, we, we understand to mean the day after he was born again. Yeah, or the minute after. Or the minute after. Yeah. He has no position, no treasures, no works. Where would we expect to see him in? Well, it's it's different from the individual that lives 50 years and doesn't have any works. Okay. This would be as if a babe died. Mm -hmm. You're acclimated to life in heaven. God will take you into the heavens because you haven't done anything that merits not being entered into the heavens. But where do we see that person in the heavens, in the hierarchy? You know, you'll see them on the lower regions. Okay, that's what I wanted to bring up. It's like a babe that dies. Mm -hmm. Babies go to heaven. Um, because they have not had time to acclimate to the corrupting influences that keep them apart. Their little spirits are wide open in love to the Holy Spirit. That's why when these monsters abort a baby to feed us, mm -hmm. that spirit goes to be with the Lord. Let's go on. <coughs> Verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot 
inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now he's talking about an individual that's alive, that hasn't died at the time of the rapture. His soul has already been changed. His body is going to be changed, so that the entire being becomes glorified by the spirit that's dwelling within him. The spirit which is given by measure will reach its fullest expansion, the fullest of his power. Remember, the spirit is in union with the soul. So the soul and the spirit reaches fullness of whatever the Father designed that soul to be in eternity. That's what it's going to be in this time. And at that point, it's a total glorified being which immediately rises and goes to be into the heavens. I've heard some debate about the term sleep. Some people yeah. seem to think that the, the spirit in the heaven is actually sleeping yeah. in a bed. Yeah, yeah that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, the only thing that sleeps is your body. Mm. The Spirits the don't the sleep. Body. You don't find anywhere in the scripture it talks about a spirit sleeping. Mm. Why would a spirit sleep? The body needs to sleep because it has to be regenerated, renewed. If it continued on, it would die. The spirit is energized consistently. It's patterned consistently for eternal life. The body is not. So at this point, when it's talking about those that sleep in Christ, it's talking about the saints that have already gone on, they have a place in the heavens. Their physical bodies are on earth in a state of what would be called repose, waiting for that spirit uh, to merge in the Holy Spirit to quicken it as a unit. So let's continue. At the trump, the last trump, the uh, Holy Spirit within the individual will quicken him. The word quicken means made alive. The Holy Spirit in the individual is going to make him experience the fullness of life in the twinkling of an eye. So what does that mean? That means that he is now in a state of glory because the Holy Spirit which is in union with his soul operating as a unit operates in its fullness. The Holy Spirit were to operate in his fullness within us this body wouldn't be able to take it. <laughs> Disintegrate probably. Anyway, so this is what we find when we're referring to the fullness of the Spirit. The earnest of the spirit that was in the person reaches its fullness at the time of glorification. At the time of glorification, the person then experiences the fullness of sonship. He becomes a fully adopted son of God, operating in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then, of course, they depart to the heavens. Turn to Romans 8. Romans 8, verse um, 22 and 23. <laughs> For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Not only they, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit. What are the first fruits of the Spirit? 
the earnest of the Spirit, the measure of the Spirit. Everybody that's born again has the measure of the Spirit dwelling within him. Otherwise, he wouldn't be born again. Paul goes on, everyone that has the first fruits of the Spirit, <clears throat> those who are mature, well, Paul puts himself in this, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. So those that are mature, who have the earnest of the Spirit, awaiting for the fullness of the Spirit. The Spirit wants to operate in His fullness, but the time is not right. At the time of the rapture, where the Father <coughs> sends the Son back, who will, at that time, signal the Spirit in every born-again believer that's mature, to now expand is going to happen instantaneously on a global scale to everybody that's at that point ready for it. Mm. Let me go back to the previous question. Yes. So, those who are born again now, today, mm -hmm. and die one minute later, mm -hmm. end up in the heavens. Mm -hmm. Because <coughs> they were babes, they're considered I guess innocent, all right. Those who should have known better, mm -hmm. been sitting on the pews for 50 years, so on and so forth, they end up in the new, in the new, world, in the new earth. Mm -hmm. Should we understand that the babe that we've just described, the one who dies a minute after being born again, will always be, will always be higher in the hierarchy in the heavens, than the person who was born again and had 50 years to actually do something with their lives. Yes. Okay. Yes. But returning to this, what we find, <coughs> the Holy Spirit will emphasize in His communion with the Spirit of the Saint progression toward this point where he can function fully within the same. This is what Paul is talking about. Paul says there is a point where you will groan, you will sigh within yourself for the expansion of the Holy Spirit's presence in its fullness. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will give you a comprehension just like he's giving us of what life will be like in its fullness in the heavens. As we go up the line, the levels of comprehension, revelation knowledge, lets us know on an ascending scale of the desirability to function in the way the Father's designed us to function. To create the way the Father's designed us to create. This is what we have been crafted to function as. So it's not something that's unusual. It is something that's to be expected. Paul is bringing this out. He's saying, if you're mature, if you're progressing, this is what you're going to experience. Embrace it. It's positive. It's a sign that you're on the right path. Just keep going. He's doing this because at the same time, and I can't make this more plain, your Adamic nature is going to be fighting tooth and claw to keep it from happening. Mm -hmm. I can't emphasize that enough. Too many Christians deviate off the path because they're not given instruction to discern between the spirit and the carnal, the carnal nature. Why? Because organized religion is not led by spirit-filled leaders. It's led by individuals who are led by their intellect. And so that's the way they're going to teach. So people aren't going to be instructed and to know, no, this shouldn't be something you're pursuing. Shut it down. This is the way. They don't, they're not instructed to rely on the Holy Spirit. They're instructed to rely on their intellect. That's why, if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, the chances of making the rapture are slim to none. Uh, Georgia? 
Chris, Chris asked the question, and I'm not sure I understood your answer. Do you remember what your question was, Chris, about if you die a minute after you're saved? <clears throat> yes. We were talking about the hierarchy of position of the person who is who dies one minute after being born again versus the person who has been born again for 50 years. That was the question. And so you said that the one that dies one minute after being saved would ha have a higher position than the other person? Yes, because the one that died has died in innocence, hasn't done anything wrong. God is going to allow him into the heavens. The person that lived for 50 years and didn't do anything with his born again experience, God's going to hold accountable. And as a result, he will As a result, he's not going to have a position at all. He's going to be a resident of the new earth, ruled over by somebody. Because he did not apply himself to what he was called to apply to. In due season. Uh, uh, Matthew. Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Starting in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling in a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. When you are born again, you enter into the family of God, you enter in with responsibilities. God expects certain things from an individual <clears throat> for the time that he has been given here on earth. Verse 15, Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Everybody gets any responsibility when they enter into the family of God. Not all of it is the same. Some are expected to do more than others. But everybody has a responsibility. Verse 16, And he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Likewise, he that had received two had gained other two. So everybody, once they're born again, you start down a path in which what God has given you, you're expected to add to whatever you have received. God doesn't want us to be idle. He expects even a young person in the faith to pursue His Word. To grow. To have something to show for the time when he became born again that is not the same as it was when he became born again. Every day there should be something added in that person's life. A babe that dies after being born again doesn't have the time to develop anything. God is not going to hold him responsible. He's saved. He's been uh, crafted for life in heaven. So the Lord in His mercy is going to take him to heaven. The individual that's been here a long time and didn't do anything, God's going to hold him responsible. So this is the significance of this. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. They've been taught a long while ago. They should be teachers. They should be teachers, exactly. They've been here long enough to do something with Fair. what yeah, they've been true. given. Absolutely correct. Does that does that answer your question? Or Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for asking your question, George. Yes, thank you very much. It Praise makes you wonder if. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you saying? No, never mind. No, it's okay. We That's welcome. Okay. We welcome your comments. Helps us. It it makes you stop and think about 
how you've lived your life up until now when you've been a Christian so long. Exactly. Well, the Lord only expects you to do what you know to do. You can't do what you don't know. So if you haven't been taught, then you're not responsible? No. How could you be if you don't know? What he will do is hold the teachers responsible. The person that should have taught you is the one that's going to have to give an account. Jeremiah 22, tell us. Jeremiah 22, Jeremiah, 1 and 2. Yes. I tell them all the time. Well, so don't put yourself on a guilt trip. Take what you have learned and apply that. That's all God's holding you responsible for. And teach other people. What That's you know. Pass on what you've learned. That's all.